Hello, this is Professor Del Russo, and the following is an excerpt of a lecture that I delivered on February 15, 2012, and it pretty much captures my philosophy on plea bargaining, along with its tremendous utility. One part that I addressed involving how plea bargaining is especially advantageous to the victim neglected to make the observation that when you have a trial, the defendant can maintain his innocence. He can continue to say that he's innocent. If a jury or judge convicts him, he can nevertheless keep on saying, I didn't do it, I was falsely accused. One of the benefits that the victim gets in a plea bargain is that the defendant has to come in and give what's called a factual basis. That is, in order for him to plead guilty and for the judge to accept the plea offer and its outcome, he has to say what he did that makes him guilty. He has to admit the crime. And that is very valuable to victims. It is a solid, concrete, and tangible expression of guilt by the defendant. And that's very important to the victim. It's very validating. And you get that through a plea bargain. In any event, here is the lecture on plea bargaining. There are plea negotiations. Now, plea bargains, plea bargains have a bad reputation in some quarters, and some people think negatively about plea bargains, and that's not surprising. I mean, if you think about the law and you are someone who believes in the integrity of the system, you might say to yourself, well, wait a minute, if we go through all this trouble to pass laws and to say what the punishments are, when somebody breaks those laws, they ought to get the sentence that's written in the book of laws. Whatever the criminal code says, they ought to get punished. Why is there this kind of negotiation, this plea bargain stuff? Why should a guy get less than he's supposed to? Well, that's a legitimate question. But the law is not mechanical. It's not mathematical. It's not some equation in which you punch numbers in and there's an outcome. And then you issue the punishment. It doesn't work that way. The law involves the testimony and evidence arising from real people, from people's frail recollections, from people who have biases and motives and connections and loyalties. So whether somebody shot somebody or whether someone molested a child or whether somebody threw a brick through a jewelry store window and stole jewelry or not is not a fact until you march people in who were there or near there at or about the time this stuff happened. And even that, in 2012, may not persuade some of these hard scrabble jurors You need to prove your case, and you need to prove it beyond a reasonable doubt, and that is easier said than done. So, plea bargaining exists despite its rather unfortunate name. Why is it unfortunate? Well, the word bargain, it's so mercantile, it's so commercial, it's the stuff of used car salesmen, not attorneys, not of the judiciary, not of the profession of the law. Bargain, bargaining. It just doesn't feel right, and I appreciate that. I like to call it plea compromise, or something like that, because I don't like the word bargain. It involves a negotiation, and it does involve a negotiation. But to compare it with the kind of negotiations that happen in a used car lot, or the haggling that goes on in a flea market, really demeans what we do. When I say we, what we do with the law. I mean, these are real people who suffered real injustices. And they ought not feel that their cases are treated like some trinket at a flea market on Route 18 in New Brunswick. That's not what it is. The system cares about them, but we can't prove every case. And here's the reasons why plea compromises continue to this day. There are three of them. And these three things are inherent in the system. They're part of the system. They can't be ignored. And they compel plea bargaining. There is not a jurisdiction 
from Maine to Florida, all the way up to the northwest corner of Washington State, right down to the Tijuana border where San Diego lie, that does not plea bargain. Now, for some time, they did abolish plea bargaining in one of our less inhabited states, where one of the more conservative female politicians alike's from, the state of Alaska. And not a lot of people in Alaska, and comparatively, not a lot of crime. So perhaps you might get away with it in Alaska, but it didn't even work there. There's plea bargaining everywhere. Why? Because there's too many cases, there's too many cases, and not enough resources. If there were 10,000 prosecutors and 700 judges and 4,000 court reporters and 20,000 secretaries and clerical support in some of these urban jurisdictions, you could try every case, but you can't. In any large jurisdiction, in the jurisdiction in which I'm standing, whether I'm in Essex County or Passaic County, doesn't matter. In both of those jurisdictions, on a Monday, on a typical Monday, a prosecutor walks into court and there's 20 to 25 cases on. Only one case can go to trial this week, right? Think about it. You've got to pick a jury, you've got to put evidence on, you have these openings, these closings, right? Jury's got to go in their room, think about it, come back with a verdict, the judge has to tell them what the law is. At least a week, on any case. Criminal mischief on a stop sign, not a felony, but if it was, it'll take you the better part of a week in a modern jury trial. So the prosecutor walks into court with 25 cases, 20 cases, could only try one of them, you got 19 left over, but guess what? Crime didn't take a holiday. Next Monday, you got 20 other cases. You got to take those other 19, put them with the 20, you got 39, you got to spread the 39 over the next three weeks. Crime didn't take a holiday. Week three, more crimes occurred. So, uh, you know, I'm overstating it, aren't I? There's lots of cases and not enough people. So, why does plea bargaining exist? Well, for one thing, it's efficient, right? It moves cases along. It may not be people's perception of the nobility of justice, but it's a very pragmatic and logical way to deal with cases. Plea bargaining survives in every state in this country because it's efficient. So that's the first reason why we have plea bargaining, efficiency. Efficiency. A related reason is economy. When I say economy, I mean not only the economy that comes with not having to try the case, not having to spend money bringing witnesses in and sequestering jurors and trying the case and doing all the stuff that makes up a trial. That's economic. Plea bargaining is efficient, and it's economical. But I'm also talking about the economy of emotions, the economy of resolving a case on behalf of the victim and the suspect, and the accused. Unfortunately, if someone gets arrested in 2012, his trial is not likely to be heard if they want a jury trial until 2014, maybe 2015. So we're running two to three years, and that's not in Essex County. God knows how many years it takes in Essex or Camden or Union County. But in the same county, we're looking at two or three years before your case goes to trial. If you're in jail, you may sit there for two years. If you're not in jail, your case can linger for three, three and a half years. Is that in juvenile court as well? No, juvenile court has a whole bunch of different rules that apply. Their cases have to be moved swiftly they do, because they don't have juries either, so things can move a little more swiftly. It's the jury that, yeah, well, it drags it along. There's other facets and factors in the adult courts, but in the juvenile division, the dynamics are quite different. They're still plea bargaining there, and they couldn't try every juvenile case in order to try these cases within 30 to 45 days, but there are institutional requirements, there are rules and laws that require that you dispose of a juvenile case within certain time periods. And they're generally resolved within a couple of months at most. And if the lawyers want it to continue longer, especially the, the accused child's lawyer, the juvenile's lawyer, then it could take longer. Obviously, if he consents, it could take longer. 
But in the adult system, it could take a couple of years, maybe three years, depending upon the case, before the case is ever resolved. So what happens? You know, every Monday when those 20 to 25 cases are listed, a notice goes to the victim and their family and to some of the witnesses. It says, listen, this case is scheduled. And you could tell that victim and their mother and the other witnesses and everyone else associated with this case over and over again, take it easy, don't get excited, your case is not going until I tell you it goes. It doesn't matter, because every time that notice comes in the mail, their heart skips a beat or two, maybe more. Every time that notice comes in the mail, they think about what's about to unfold, about what's going on in their lives, about what might happen next week, about what he might say when he goes to court, about whether he's going to say he did it or not, about whether he's going to make me go into court and stand on the witness stand and tell my story, about whether my friends are going to find out if I go to court, about whether they're going to take my picture if I walk into the courtroom about whether if he found not guilty, he's going to come and get me or hurt me. Every time a kid gets that notice, or their parent or caregiver, or somebody affiliated with that trial gets that notice, whatever their role is, they get anxious. Sometimes more anxious than others, but they get anxious. So there are emotions involved. We want to, want to recognize it or not. And when I talk about efficiencies, when I talk about economy, by resolving it today, that stops, does it? kid don't have to worry about that anymore, do they? They don't. So plea bargaining is valuable. Plea bargaining brings efficiencies in economy, not only economic money kind of economy, but it brings some peace to the child and the family and the participants in the prosecution. It is emotionally economic. To end today, which could drag on for three years, is emotionally economic. And it's in the interest of the victim and their family and the system and justice. It is justice. It's the best kind of justice. So plea bargaining is not a bad word. It's necessary. Well, as all bargains, they require both sides to receive a benefit, right? When you go to the flea market, you go buy that piece of jewelry, and you try to negotiate it to some price you can live with, the vendor's going to make some money, you're going to have your piece of jewelry, everybody's happy, they get cash, you get the item. Well, plea bargaining would not exist unless the accused has some value. And that value comes from letting, getting less than the maximum. That value comes from getting less than the maximum sentence. That's what we give up. And it's important that we have that ability so that we can be efficient, be economic, and meet the needs of the children and their caregivers and the, and the parties to the prosecution because the system is so clogged. Now, going back to the emotional economy for a second, the defendant feels the same way. Every week that the defendant's hauled into court, there's the potential for bad things to happen. I told you how victims and their families feel. Every time they get that notice, every six weeks, for two years, three years. Well, think about the defendant. At least the victim and the family, we tell them to stay home. He's got to sit in the courtroom. Or he's got to sit in the jailhouse. He's one of 19 or 20 or 23 cases on the calendar that day. And any day could be his day. He doesn't know whether his case is going to get called. Think about the heartbeats that happen there. Think about the emotions for that defendant as he comes into court and sits there with all the other defendants who are on the calendar, all the other defendants who are brought by, brought over to the courthouse in a secure van and left in the basement of the courthouse in a jail cell and then brought up talk to their lawyers. His case could be today's case. And nothing good happens in a courtroom for a defendant. At best, maybe he gets to go home. So there's an interest for him, right? There's an interest for him in settling this, in stopping the madness, in stopping the process. Nothing worse than having this hanging over your head for two years, three years. Kids and the accused have a mutual interest in finality. Finality, efficiency in economy, and the last one, certainty. Certainty. I consider efficiency economy the same thing, or related concepts. That's why I say there's three. 
finality, it's over. Efficiency in the economy costs less money if you resolve the case. There's less trauma for everybody if you resolve the case. And certainty, the courthouse, the criminal courts, the civil courts, all courtrooms, but especially the criminal courts, are uncertain places. Nobody knows the outcome. No matter how strong the evidence is, there could be a not guilty. No matter how weak the evidence is, there could be a guilty. No one knows the outcome. I've been around long enough to realize that I don't care what the facts are. I don't care how good the case seems or how bad the case seems. No one knows what the jury's going to do. I told you about that poor woman from San Francisco, I mean from New York City, who was uh, accosted by those police officers in Lower Manhattan. Uh, Casey Anthony, everybody thought, was going to be convicted. I really didn't think the evidence was that strong there, but the average person thought it was such a great case. Obviously, the OJ case, the evidence was overwhelming. Not guilty. Casey Anthony, not guilty. These police officers, not guilty. And then there's cases that are weak and lousy. Guilty. I've won my fair share of cases where I thought I had a lousy case. I did everything in my power to plea bargain that case. Couldn't do it. Got convictions. Tried cases where I thought I had the best evidence in the world. Not guilty. So there's uncertainty in the courtroom. And look, it doesn't happen all the time. Usually you can figure out whether it's a good case or not. Usually you can figure out how a jury might react to the case, but you never know. It's an uncertain place. So what does plea bargaining bring? Certainty. You know what the outcome is. No, he's not getting 10, but he's getting 4. I know it, you know it, he knows it, everybody knows it. There's something in it for him. If he loses, he's looking at 10. The victim, if he, if he wins and the victim loses, so to speak, he gets nothing. So now we got four, and everybody knows what they're getting. And a bad guy goes to jail for four years. And the victim may feel a little bit better. Maybe there's justice because he went to jail for four years. And he feels a little bit better because he knows on a four-year sentence, maybe he can get out in a year and nine months, or maybe two years. He knows what the outcome is, the victim knows what the outcome is, and that's a good thing. And the government knows what the outcome is, and there's a punishment. So finality, efficiency, and certainty. These are the things that make plea bargaining endure. Any questions about plea bargaining? Now here a student has a question. But before we get into the answer to that question, it's important that we appreciate exactly what plea bargaining is, and I never really get into it in this lecture. So plea bargaining involves criminal sentencing. Now, for example, the sentence for a first-degree crime is 10 to 20 years in jail. That's what the laws of the state of New Jersey say someone who commits that kind of crime should get in state prison. So if you commit an aggravated sexual assault, the penalty should be anywhere between 10 and 20 years. Now, plea bargaining involves the prosecutor setting an artificial cap. That is, he or she offers to the defendant a top number that's less than the 20-year top number. So, in essence, the prosecutor limits the defendant's potential jail time exposure. And that's where he gets some sort of solid expectation about what the outcome is going to be. For example, in a first degree plea offer, the prosecutor might offer a sentence anywhere between 10 and 13 years in state prison. So rather than the 20 years being the cap, or the worst that the defendant can do if he's convicted, here there's a hard cap or ceiling at 13 years. So that's the benefit that he gets from the plea bargain. Now the prosecutor can offer other benefits to a defendant, like promise that there will not be a period of parole ineligibility, or maybe a recommendation about how certain counts in the indictment might run concurrent with one another, or a recommendation that the defendant serve his time at one facility over another. There's lots of other collateral promises that can be made, collateral bargains, but the most important one 
is the hard cap or limit on the potential sentence. And in the example I gave you, the typical sentence is 10 to 20 years, but in the plea bargain, the defendant would be facing no more than 13 years. So the question is, the question from the student is during this lecture, is it the judge who makes the plea offer? Does the judge determine what the terms of the plea bargain are? No. Now, the judge has the power if he or she thinks the plea is too hard. Well, not so harsh, but too lenient. Because they can always give less than what the prosecutor recommends. So if it's too harsh, the prosecutor says, all right, this is a 20-year sentence. We're going to give 18. The judge is not going to go, well, that's too harsh. I think you should give him 12. He can just simply sentence him to 12 years. But if the prosecutor says, all right, it's a 20-year case, I'm going to give six months, the judge could not accept the plea bargain as being too lenient. But that very rarely happens. Your question was, who makes the decision? It's the prosecutor. In consultation with the victim and in consultation with their supervisors. They make the decision about what to offer. Is there ever any kind of case where there's no plea bargain or it's off the table? Yes, there are cases like that that come up from time to time. It's very rare because there's uncertainty. But if it is particularly heinous and the evidence is particularly compelling and the guy deserves the maximum sentence, uh, then you might not offer a plea bargain. It's very rare because evidence is not always as persuasive as you might think. But sometimes there's videos these days, sometimes there's stuff that's indisputable that you might go forward. But even now, we do a lot of these cases, the Sheriff's Department does a lot of these cases, we prosecute a lot of them, where men, uh, mostly men, are online and chatting with, you know, 8th grade and 7th grade girls trying to meet them to have sex. And it's usually an undercover police officer, it's an undercover operation that many jurisdictions do. And, you know, in those cases... They're nearly impossible to win if you're the accused. You know, you can say, well, it was my 12-year-old son who was doing it, or your wife, you can blame them, but the, the computer comes back to some guy's house, you know, and they usually tell personal facts about themselves. I mean, the, the cases are overwhelming. We have cases where the person manufactures child pornography, where they molest children and record it, and they're in the video. They ain't got to be a plea bargain. That concludes the excerpt from the February 15, 2012 lecture on plea bargaining.